High pass, low pass. When it comes to image editing, what do these things even mean? Well, so glad you asked. Let's find out. Hi, and welcome to episode 36 of Understanding Darktable. This time, we're going to look at two modules you've probably seen, but maybe never used because you didn't understand them. High pass and low pass. In image editing, a high pass routine effectively ignores areas of low complexity. In other words, when there is little change in color, saturation, and or luminosity across neighboring pixels. But where there is greater level of deviation between neighboring pixels, then those areas get affected more. The high pass filter is best used as a sharpening module. Now, I won't claim to know exactly how the actual sharpen module does its thing, but what the high pass module does is allow us to focus on only the finest details in the image. Much like using the fine end of the wavelet controls in modules like Equalizer. And because our perception of sharpness is based on luminosity contrasts at edges, it makes sense that you'd want to work on fine details rather than coarse details. Coarse details being large areas of consistent or slow changing luminosity hue and saturation. But before we go any further, it should be stressed that this module is designed to be used with a blending mode applied. The Darktable user manual suggests soft light. Personally, I prefer overlay but you should try a few of them and decide what works best for you. Also, I suggest, and this is only my recommendation, that you set your view to 100% when doing any kind of sharpening work. It's best to be viewing one-to-one -one pixel info so that you don't accidentally apply more sharpening than you need to. All right, so I've got this image that I shot last weekend. This is actually a 12-image panoramic stitch. And we'll zoom into 100% so that we're seeing all of this nice rock face detail. And when we look at the high pass module, you can see that we've only got two controls, sharpness and contrast boost. Now, if we turn the module on, we immediately see a grayscale rendition of our image. And ideally, what we want to do is drop this sharpness value right down until it disappears and then bring it up just so that we're seeing the very finest of the fine edge detail. Next, we want to drop this contrast boost right back to zero, and then we're going to switch our blending mode to uniform and overlay. And right now, because we've dropped the contrast boost back to zero, we're seeing no sharpening applied to the image. If we toggle the module off, there's no difference. Toggle back on. So now we can start to bring up this contrast boost to add some sharpening to our image. And on the finer edge detail stuff like the rocks, it looks great, but on the sky it looks absolutely horrible. But that's okay. Now, how high you drive this will be dependent on a few different things. The image resolution, how sharp the image was to begin with, the intended display format, and of course, personal preference. Now, I will say it is very easy to overdo this control. I usually end up somewhere around 20 to 30% on my images, but like I said, it will be dependent upon resolution. And you should always check both a 100% zoomed in view and a fully zoomed out view because sometimes it can look great at 100%, but then you zoom out and you go, oh, wow, I've totally overcooked that. So at 20%, turn the module off. Everything gets a little bit softer. Switch back on. Sharpness looks really nice. Zoom back in again. Check it without. Yep, everything looks a little bit softer and mushier. Switch back on. Just nice little bit of sharpening on the rocks. Now, like I said, personal preference, you might want to boost that contrast a little bit higher. That's entirely up to you. But that is essentially it for the high pass module. As for the opacity slider, in my opinion, you should never need it because that contrast boost essentially is the controller by which you determine how much sharpening you apply to the image. So 
why you would boost that to an insane level and then back off with the opacity slider, I don't know. I personally feel like you can just leave opacity at 100% and just dial that contrast boost up to a point where you're comfortable with how the image looks both up close and zoomed out. Let's grab another image and have a look at the low pass module. Now, in theory, a low pass filter does the opposite of a high pass filter. It basically works on areas where there is little complexity and ignores areas of finer detail. The low pass module is designed for applying blur to an image, but with a level of control you don't usually get with a standard blur tool. As you can see, we've got a radius slider, a soften width drop down menu, and contrast, brightness, and saturation sliders. The module is also designed to be used with a blending mode, typically overlay. But like I've said before, rules are made to be broken, so feel free to experiment. The soften width drop down offers a choice of Gaussian or bilateral blur. Gaussian will apply a blur to the lightness channel as well as the A and B color channels. The bilateral setting will only apply blur to the lightness channel. Now, according to the manual, the idea here is that this setting will not blur edge detail as much as Gaussian blur will. But that doesn't make sense to me. If you think about it, we perceive edge detail based on luminosity more than colour, right? So I would have thought that if you wanted the filter to preserve edge detail, you'd have it affect the colour info but not the luminosity channel. Maybe I misunderstand how the filter works. Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> I've got an image here of Julianne. This was shot at an abandoned railway station last weekend. Now, let's say I wanted to soften her skin a little bit. I'd start by switching to a bilateral blur so that we preserve our edges. If we zoom in on this upright just behind her ear, we can really see the difference between the Gaussian blur and the bilateral blur. So you can really see how it's trying to preserve those edges. The same can be seen down here on the edges of her shirt. On the bilateral filter, we've got these crisper edges on the edge of the fabric, but when we go to a Gaussian blur, everything is softened equally. So we'll go with the bilateral filter. Radius, as you might imagine, sets the spread of the blur. And because I've not yet set a blending mode, we're currently seeing the level of blur being applied in its raw form. Let's now switch our blend mode to uniform and overlay. If we grab our opacity slider and pivot between the two extremes, we can see before and after. And straight away what I'm seeing is that the saturation is out of control so I'm going to back that off and that does darken the red of her shirt but at the same time it's lightened her skin tones so a bit of a balancing job there you could use other modules if you were really concerned about the color of the fabric and wanting to get that back to where it started but now if we wanted to soften her skin further we could increase the radius and it's then just a case of playing around with how much contrast do we want. If we go to negative values, we end up making it look like she hasn't had a wash for a couple of weeks. Uh, don't want that. So choose how much contrast we want in the image. We can use our brightness control to just overall darken or lighten the image. And before and after. So it lightens the skin, it certainly softens the details on the skin, and we end up with a kind of soft bleached look to our image. And if that's what you're after, sweet. I'm sure there are other uses for the low pass module, but I don't know what they are, and the Darktable manual doesn't provide any other use cases. If you have other ways in which you use it, please add a comment below. 
In the episode extension for Patreon supporters, we're going to delve a little deeper into how we could use this module to selectively soften Julie's skin without affecting the entire image. Okay, a couple of other things to cover. As you might have noticed, I'm probably going to go without the headshot picture-in-picture -picture for now, at least while I'm still learning DaVinci Resolve. I might bring it back later, we'll see how I go. It's also to do with me trying to read the script off the teleprompter as well as look at my monitor. A uh, bit of viewer feedback from the last couple of weeks. Alban Blaschka, in relation to episode 11, said... Maybe still useful under dtstyle.net. There is a collection of some nice styles for Darktable with examples and downloads. Bruce, thanks for this series. Really taking a lot out of it. Glad to hear it. Leona Devon, in response to last episode, episode 35, said, Thanks, Bruce. I love the spot tool. Always use it. Can't remember where I heard it, but they said that to select a grey spot in the image to get the white balance from, and that's been my technique. I guess the flicking of the video is down to the new editor. Seems to be cutting out a lot. I tried to find you on Patreon with no luck. Do you put a link anywhere? Thanks again for a great vid. Do I not put a link up often enough? I thought I had, but I will put it on screen right now and I'll make it flash and I'll make it large and I'll make it do lots of things so you can't miss it. <laughs> uh, thank you to those people who have supported me on Patreon. Much appreciated. Marcos said, thanks for the video. I'm not fluent in English, so I don't think it would be very helpful for translations. But one thing I'm sure of is that Google's translator is not very reliable. I think it'd be much better to use DeepL, deepl.com slash translate later. He's much more careful with the nuances of the language. Interesting. Thank you. Cosmo said, I did realize that you were talking slower when you said that you were reading. I knew why. By the way, slower is better for your viewers. We can process the data better, I think. Thank you. Well, Cosmo, I hope I haven't gone too far in the other extreme. I know this is a slightly pacier delivery than the last episode. I'm trying to find a nice balance uh, in terms of getting the scroll speed of the teleprompter and all that sort of stuff happening. So we'll we'll get it there eventually. Now, last episode, I mentioned the idea of transcriptions. First of all, a big shout out to Anders Tello Abrego, Carlos Nagira and Frank Heisters, who helped with translations into Spanish, Portuguese and Dutch, respectively. Thanks, guys. Much appreciated. However, Anders, who spent some considerable time building a spreadsheet template for creating translations into any language, came across a button in YouTube's interface which will do real-time closed captions in any language from the original English transcript. Now, as Marcos did say, sometimes Google's translation engine's a bit hit and miss in terms of its accuracy. I'd love to hear from you guys on that front. Apparently, Portuguese is spoken differently in South America to how it's spoken in Portugal. So that begs the question, do I continue to spend time on translations or is the YouTube auto-generated closed captions good enough? If Portuguese is the only language which Google doesn't really translate very well, I can certainly liaise with Carlos or someone on a South American Portuguese translation. If you didn't know that that feature was there, give it a go and see how the translation is in your native tongue. Well, that'll do it for this app. Again, Patreon supporters at Tier 3 and above get access to the episode extensions, which include a slightly deeper dive into what's being covered in this episode. If you would like to support my work, please hit the link, which will be in the video description down below. And thank you to those who have once again. All right, see you in the next one.